I'd like to welcome you. My name is Todd Percy. I am co-president of Powered Up Baraboo. I'm glad to welcome you to Why Trees Matter, a presentation by Mike Hardy, the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Forestry at the City of Baraboo. This event is co-sponsored by the Carnegie Shardy Memorial Public Library and our group Powered Up Baraboo. Uh, I want to thank library, the library, especially Joan Wheeler over here, who is in charge of marketing, adult programming, and is the interlibrary loan coordinator for helping make this talk possible. Joan is making a video of Mike's presentation, which will be posted on the library's YouTube channel at a future date. Do I have that correct? Perfect. Powered Up Baraboo was formed in 2019. Our purpose is to help Baraboo participate in the ongoing global clean energy transition. We're working with community partners such as the Baraboo School District, the City of Baraboo, and Habitat for Humanity on exciting projects in solar energy, energy efficiency, getting some EV charging stations in Baraboo, and you've likely heard of the effort to put a lot of solar panels atop the high school and the middle school. Um, that made the papers this week. Uh, please take a newsletter if you haven't. We have a few of them over there. Um, and you can add your name to an email list that we have. We're trying to get a lot of supporters. So when we go to the city of Baraboo and advocate for a sustainability committee, we can say we have X amount of supporters in the school district who align with our goals. We would appreciate you supporting them. We would also love to have you join one of our action teams to be part of our efforts as well. Um, I can talk to you about that later after this if you're interested. Our Green Spaces Action Team asked Mike Hardy to speak tonight. We all know that rising CO2 levels are harming the planet, just as we know that trees matter, because they are part of the solution. Trees matter in two ways. They pull carbon out of the air for storage in the roots, trunks, and branches in a natural process. You might have heard of it. It's known as sequestration. So tree planting on a large scale is one of many strategies to reduce global CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Trees also matter because they can counteract the effects of extreme heat. Neighborhoods with denser tree canopy are cooler and healthier for people and animals. No doubt, Mike will explain why throwing this kind of shade is actually a good thing. <laughs> Mike Hardy is an excellent partner in our efforts to develop more green spaces, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote native plantings as well as tree planting, and much more. Um, I actually, in my day job, run, uh, work for something called the Baraboo Range Preservation Association. And my offices are upstairs, and I've partnered a lot with Mike. And I was looking back at some of the things we worked on together, uh, some of its bird city activities, tree city. Um, we've done some work with you at Maxwell Potter. And now we're starting out at uh, Jackson property. Um, I have found him and his city forester, Matt Hess, to be thoughtful stewards of the city's tree banks and natural areas offering us beautiful park-like settings that enhance the local quality of life. Um, the way this works tonight, Mike will take uh, questions as we go along, but there will probably be time at the end for uh, additional comments and questions as well. And then Mary Ann Cutter, our awesome co-president for Powered Up Airbu, will end with a final, world, uh, final word. We'll have you out of here by, we promise, 8 o'clock at the latest. Um, thanks again for coming, and it's Mike Hardy. Thank you. Uh, don't clap yet, I haven't said anything, so you might, uh, might want to hold that. So, uh, Anyway, I want to thank uh, Powered Up Baraboo and the library for co-sponsoring this, and Powered Up Baraboo for asking me to come speak to you. Um, I always enjoy talking about uh, different things related to parks, recreation, conservation uh, issues. And um, so when I was approached, um, I think it was a little, maybe almost two years ago, uh, with the idea um, Powered Up had... Uh, had brought up this idea and so we started talking a little bit about it and then COVID hit so it got pushed back and got pushed back again and we talked a little bit about doing a virtual event and um, we, I kind of like doing things more interactive. Uh, it's hard for me to talk in front of a camera and know if what I'm talking about people are actually listening to. So here I can see if people are starting to nod off, fall asleep and then I can change the topic or whatever. So. Um, so anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to come back here. We're still stuck in masks, but it's a little bit better than, uh, than last year and hopefully it continues to get better. So, um, so hopefully we can have a good discussion here. Uh, like Todd mentioned, if you have any questions, just go ahead and bring them up at any time, uh, interrupt me. Um, basically how I usually do presentations or how I usually speak, I like to speak interactively. So 
the presentation kind of goes how you want it to go. So if we're talking about something that doesn't interest you, we kind of go on and talk, to, talk about something else that might interest you a little bit more. So making the most use of your time, making the most use of our time. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert. A lot of you know more about trees than I do. I'll learn from you just like you learn from me. You'll learn from each other. And that's kind of uh, how I hope these uh, presentations kind of go, or the presentations that I do at least. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the city's tree program. So I'll kind of go in and do a little summary on, on what we do for the city here uh, as far as our uh, tree planting program, our urban forestry program. And then we'll go in and talk a little bit about some of the, th a lot of the things that we've all heard about uh, through the news. We hear all, all about the uh, uh, carbon dioxide, the global warming, ozone layer, all of that stuff. We'll talk a little bit about that, but then we'll kind of relate that to how that, uh, how that relates to the city of Baraboo. So how does it relate to us? We hear about everything out there in the world, and the world's a big place. Uh, everything going out over in you know China and down the rainforest, but what does that matter to us? You know, uh, here in Baraboo, um, how can we kind of uh, um, bring that so we can kind of understand what those numbers mean? 818 pounds of carbon. You know, how much is that? Uh, you know, uh, weights of gases, things like that. Uh, what? How does that translate to you know my car? How much does that use? That sort of thing. So we'll go into a little bit of that, and then we can talk a little bit about um, you know what we can do is private individuals as homeowners. Um, if, if we've got a smaller, smaller lot that maybe has three or four trees, how does that relate to a, um, a, a city that has 6,000 trees that, uh, uh, that we take care of? And, and, and does, does a, a, a single lot with three or four trees really matter? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So, <clears throat> so anyway, for a uh, little, uh, little bit summary, I guess a little bit about um, myself really quickly. Um, I've been a park, uh, municipal park and recreation administrator for 26 years now. 12 of those have been here in Baraboo. Um, I didn't, my, originally I, I wasn't in a formal educate, or formal uh, forestry education program. So um, I came up, I got my degree in recreation management. And like a lot of uh, park directors, forestry directors that you find around the state, we start out, uh, we were athletes or coaches and we did a lot of coaching, and then the city that we worked for, the municipality that we worked for, needed someone to take over the forestry program as forestry got bigger and bigger. So we got sent to trainings and that sort of thing, and that's kind of how we got into it. So, so I don't have a, a formal education background, or I didn't come with a formal education background in forestry. I learned it as I went. So over the last 26 years, I've been a city forester for a couple of different cities, um, and then I went to workshops, trainings, eventually got my um, certification from the ISA as a certified arborist. And then I went on and got uh, as a uh, municipal uh, specialist certified arborist. At that time, that was uh, maybe eight years ago, nine years ago, there were only 10 municipal uh, specialists, uh, certified arborists, municipal specialists in the state of Wisconsin, about 217 in the United States. There haven't been too many more from that. So the difference, there's uh, different levels of arborists. Uh, certified arborist is the most common. Those are usually the ones that are working a lot with the trees. Matt Hess, who Todd had mentioned, he's also a certified arborist. So it's very rare for a city of this size to have just one, let alone one certified arborist. We've got two of them. Uh, it's very rare, a very rare thing. So it's uh, something that we're very fortunate to have. Matt does an excellent job. He's kind of our technical expert as far as uh, tree prunings, maintenance, removal, plantings, those sort of things. Um, the role of a municipal specialist is more of the, um, the planning, uh, uh, preserving trees during construction, uh, budgeting, those type of things, um, kind of doing some of the less of the scientific things, but more of the, uh, the political part of it, the budgeting part of it, that sort of thing. So, uh, and that's where my, my role kind of gets into. Some of the education as well, working with some of the tree city programs, bird city programs, doing some of the promotions, those sort of type of things. Um, so the city of Baraboo has been a member of Tree City USA for, uh, since 1992. Um, the uh, uh, Tree City uh, USA, if you're not familiar with it, uh, basically there, there's different categories that you have to meet, uh, different uh, levels you have to meet, and those have to be renewed every year. Uh, one of the big ones is a tree ordinance. The city has to have a tree ordinance, with the, which the city uh, did, has done. Uh, annually, we have, every year, we have to celebrate Arbor Day. Um, we do that through, uh, through school tree plantings, through community tree plantings, uh, through talks, presentations, that type of thing. Um, and uh, we have a thing, or they have a thing uh, called uh, uh, the Tree Growth Award. And we've had uh, five of those um, in our 29 years now, I guess. 
Um, so 1993, the second year, uh, right away. And then uh, we had a string of four of them in a row. Um, we've actually qualified for a couple of other ones that we didn't get the application turned in on time. But, um, and we're also be, we're actually qualified uh, this year as well, so we just have to turn in our application. So uh, the city's done a really good job uh, uh, with their tree program, with their forestry program over the years. We completed a uh, tree inventory in uh, 2010, updated in 2014. We received a uh, DNR grant to do that, and uh, we put it on uh, computer, so we have a, a, a computerized count of all the trees that we, uh, we do manage and we inventory in the city. Uh, we completed an urban forestry management plan in 2010 and an emerald ash borer preparedness plan in 2010. Uh, as most of you know, EAB uh, was found here in 2015, we found it. Uh, Devil's Lake was the year before that. Um, and then, of course, in Wisconsin, 2008, I believe, was the first year it was found. So the city did a really good job. I came here in 2009, and the city was already, already had their, um, their plans kind of started, worked out, uh, which was really good because uh, we didn't have anything in the county here yet. It was over in the eastern part of the state. Um, but the Parks Commission, the city, was uh, uh, very proactive in making sure that we were prepared before it got here. Um, so we designed and installed an Arboretum in 2015. It's been through several phased uh, improvements. We're one of the few uh, smaller communities that has their own Arboretum. So that's something we're, we're very proud of. It's down at uh, Maxwell Potter Conservancy. The Arboretum is a, uh, a place where you can go see what a tree is going to look like. So we've planted various, a bunch of different kinds of trees there. So when a, uh, when a homeowner gets a tree in their, in their, uh, planted in their lawn, they want to know what it looks like. Rather than going to the internet, seeing pictures, uh, you can go out to a place and you can see, you can see, you can touch, you can feel a tree, what it's actually going to look like. Uh, if you're talking to honey locust, you can go to the honey locust. We've got signage there and see exactly what it's going to look like, uh, the leaves, the size, that sort of thing. Um, we've hosted several forestry presentations and workshops. Uh, we added uh, forestry staff in 2016. That's Matt Hess, um, our forestry specialist. Um, so we're, uh, we've kind of grown our staff so that we're doing a lot more in-house now. That allows us to, um, to be able to uh, respond to a lot more uh, tree emergencies, do a lot more planting, do a lot more efficiently, a lot more cost-effectively. Uh, we manage over 6,000 public trees. Um, those are all the street trees, the right-of-way trees, and the park trees. Those don't include, in our inventory, we don't include the, uh, the trees uh, along the riverbank, for example. Um, wh whether they're in a, a conservancy or a, a city park, uh, it's, uh, we don't really uh, con uh, include those in the, in the inventory. Uh, we started EAB treatments of ash trees in 2014. Uh, we found our first find here in 2015, but we had already started treatments before that. So uh, the city's done a really good job, and we've had the advantage of seeing other cities, the effect that it's had on it. So we've been prepared for it. Uh, and it really, um, that way we've been financially prepared for it. We haven't had to go down the street and see some of the effects that we saw for like Dutch Island disease and what some of the other cities had seen for EAB. With our tree losses, um, last year we built the, a gravel bed. What a gravel bed is, that's down at the community gardens. We received a grant for that. And what a gravel bed is, is it's a, just what it sounds like. It's a bed of gravel. Uh, we put bare root treats, trees in there. We can buy smaller trees and put the trees in there and they'll, the roots will grow, the root system will grow while we have, uh, until we get time to plant them out, out in the street or out in the park, that sort of thing. In the past, we would have to make a tree order from a nursery company. The order would come in whenever the, the uh, company could get it in. We'd have 50 or 100 trees come in at once, and we've got a small staff, so all of a sudden our staff has to find, uh, find time to go out there and plant 50 or 100 trees you know, within a week or so before it dries out. Now what we can do is we can order however many trees we want, uh, if it comes in on the semi, then we just pop them in the gravel bed and we can plant two or three at a time whenever, uh, three or four months down the road, we can plant them. A lot more efficient for our staff. It's also uh, better for the tree because the, uh, the root system will actually grow within that uh, um, gravel. And so it's a little bit easier for that transplant uh, to go into its uh, new spot. Um, and then our goals uh, continue to be um, not more than 10% of any tree species that you'll find in any, any community. We've been doing that uh, in all communities across the state and really across uh, the U.S. have really been starting doing that a lot with, uh, with EAB. We saw during uh, Dutch elm disease, didn't quite learn our lesson during that because there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of streets that a lot of you probably remember going down the street and just everything was just wiped out. 
Um, after Dutch elm disease, there were still a lot of mistakes made. There were a lot of silver maples that were planted. Silver maples were great because they grew really, really fast. A lot of people wanted their shade replaced really, really fast. So a lot of places put in silver maples. Not the best tree, or not the best street tree, um, because we're having problems with those now. But uh, other things that were put in were ash, a lot of ash. Ash was a very good tree, a very good street tree. Um, but a lot of them very close together. So we saw emerald ash borer come, and then we saw a lot of the same effects of Dutch elm disease. So now the whole um, the, uh, education has been to keep everything below 10%, spread everything out. So the next thing that we have come along here, and who knows what it's going to be, eventually there's going to be something come along, and um, it's going to take out maples. Hopefully not maples, because we're overplanted maples, just as most people are. So. Um, yes? Uh, yeah, the, the treatment the e, uh, treatment for emerald ash borer, what exactly is that? What do you do? Okay, um, Okay. yes, so good question. The, uh, so the question was, what do we do for treatments of emerald ash borer? Um, there are different treatments that are used out there. Most municipalities like us, uh, we use an injection treatment. Um, so it's uh, triage is the, uh, the name brand of, of what we use and what a lot of communities use. Um, so what they do, depending on the size of the tree, the, di the diameter of breast height, um, will determine how much um, injection they need to put in there. But they go around to each tree, drill holes in the bottom of the trunk, and then they'll actually inject the, the medicine uh, into it. Uh, the tree has to be, uh, every other year, they typically have to hit that tree again. So what, uh, what we do and what the Parks Commission does is they look at the quality of the ash trees that we have, and that's why that uh, inventory is so important. When we have the inventory, it not only marks the species of the tree we have, the number of the tree we have, the locations, uh, but it's also the size of the, of the tree. And that determines how much, um, how much of the triage, how much of the injection that, the, that those trees need. So we contract that out. We don't have anyone uh, on staff that does that, but we do contract that out. We started out, um, we had a little over 1,400 ash trees here in the city, which was, um, I believe, 18% uh, uh, back in 2010. So we were over that 10% that we wanted, um, but we had uh, 1,400 trees, ash trees. We had to decide which ones we were going to treat, which ones eventually we knew were going to die because of emerald ash borer. So anything that wasn't treated, we've seen by other cities, was going to eventually su uh, succumb to uh, EAB. So uh, what we did is we looked at the higher quality uh, ash trees. We didn't uh, treat anything under, I believe it was six or seven inches at that time, because those are easy trees to remove. They're not very costly to remove. Uh, we didn't treat anything that was you know, under power lines, that was in poor condition. Anything that was fair condition or below wasn't treated because those were trees that were going to be removed eventually anyway, weren't as high quality. We focused on the higher quality trees. At that time, it was a very high cost. Um, it came down in price quite a bit. Uh, we were treating, we ended up treating about 600 of our 1,400 ash trees on a uh, rotating basis, so not all 600 at once, obviously. Um, we're now down because, uh, and that, what that did our goal wasn't to treat everything indefinitely because it was about uh, started out being eighteen thousand dollars a year to treat those those trees, and that's something that obviously taxpayers don't want to continue paying for. So our goal was to use that so we didn't have to take down six hundred trees in one year because um, taxpayers don't like that either. But um, so so we could kind of uh, uh, phase that in and then replant trees as we could and keep the canopy up there as best, as best we could. Um, we're now down to, we're treating um, about 150 ash trees that we have left to treat now. So our costs have went, down, went from about 18,000 when we started in 2014. Uh, this year we spent $3,000 um, to treat those, uh, the trees that we do have left on that rotating basis. So eventually our goal is to get down to zero. There might be a few trees. Uh, we've got some nice ash trees out here that probably will continue to uh, treat uh, for a while because um, obviously it takes a while to get that shade back up and get those statement trees back up like that. Um, How successful overall is that treatment? Uh, the triage treatment has, um, they've reported about a 97, 98% um, on, their, on their marketing and everything and we've heard that from other cities. We've seen at least about a 98% um, from ours, 98% success rate. So we've lost a couple of them but really it's been very successful for us. Um, again, costly, but um, we've also seen uh, some of the effects, uh, especially out in Michigan, uh, places they had a hit before they had uh, some of this uh, treatment that they can do. And uh, we knew back in 2015 when we found it, 
we knew that it had been here for a while. We knew uh, back in 2010 when we did our management plan, we figured it was probably here, we just haven't found it yet. So, What, it, what do you think of that policy that some places have had where when they see they get emerald ash borer, they just cut everything down? Uh, I mean, isn't it possible yeah. that some of those trees would be resistant you know, over time? So if you just let them go until they actually do die, why cut them down <laughs> ahead of time? Yeah, there's, um, I know a few communities like that that chose to, um, rather than spend the money on injections, chose to either hire more staff so they could take down more trees or contract more so they could take down more trees um, or, and uh, just wipe out more and then plant right away, which is kind of rip the Band-Aid off and, and you know, take the complaints about losing the canopy and then putting in the new trees and waiting 20 or 30 years till those mature. Um, quite a few communities, communities that did that. Um, personally, I was glad that the city of Baraboo didn't, chose not to do that, chose to invest in the injections. Um, but, um, you know, I understand, uh, understand that, that side of things as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, um, it, fortunately, again, fortunately for us, we saw what worked and what didn't work for other communities, so that made our choices a little bit easier. And, and when the city was, uh, uh, was willing to budget the money for us to do some treatments, knowing that we had a plan that we weren't going to treat forever, um, that, uh, that we were going to work on continuing to uh, maintain the can canopy that we did have and diversify the species. So, um, so I, I'm not a big fan of those type of wipeouts like that, but um, uh, I'm also not a big fan of spending a lot of money for, uh, uh, for pesticides and things like that as well. So, yeah. Am I right that there are no resistant ash, um, that there are no resistant green ash, that this is an insect that will attack and it's there aren't any resistant ones, is that right? There's nothing now that at least that I know of. Um, I know um, nurseries are always working for, uh, for different hybrids and things like that. Um, you know, there's some elms out there now that uh, they're starting to come back, um, that they're starting to use. That's a, that's a different kind of right. thing. Right, yep. That's a fungus, right? Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so there's, yeah, the, the emerald ash borer, yeah, there, um, there hasn't been any good news coming out for any, any new kind of ash or anything like that, um, any, anything resistant. Um, so the, the main thing that um, a lot of communities have been doing is working on diversifying and not, not using ash, you know, kind of putting ash aside and saying, oh, it was a great tree while it lasted. Maybe something will come eventually. Maybe they'll be able to be able to do something, something differently. But uh, focusing on these other trees and trying to get enough species so that we can go get down to those, you know, under t under 10 percent because everyone loves maples. Every every community is like us and they've got you know 25, 30 percent of their inventory is maples. Um, and eventually something's going to uh, you know hit the maples. And um, a few years ago there was a, a threat down in the Chicago area uh, that we thought was probably going to you know going to hit the maples and that kind of worried a lot of us. But fortunately they. They were able to control that. It was the Asian longhorn beetle, um, but they were able to control that. So, um, so fortunately, we haven't had anything yet. But it's only a matter of time before something else comes and in, in, in attacks. Yeah. Any treatment other than the individual tree treatment for the EAB, or is that all we can do right now? Is individual trees? Um, there's different. There's different methods. Um, like the like I mentioned, um, most. Uh, it's more expensive to do the injections, um, the single tree uh, in injections, but it's also more effective, the 96, 97%. Effectiveness is a lot more than the, um, the ground saturation. There's um, a lot of homeowners, obviously you have to be a licensed uh, pesticide applicator to do the injections, some of those injections. A lot of homeowners would, uh, would get the powders or the uh, liquids that you could saturate the soil, just pour on the soil. Not as effective, but a lot cheaper and uh, oftentimes that's uh, that's every year. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that, so so I don't know. But so anyway, on the forest basis, as far as the forest bases, that and that's where it gets really tough because okay. once you get out there in the forest, um, and you know groups like Nature Conservancy and Baraboo Range, uh, they're dealing with a lot more of that. And it's um, you know, I, I don't know. It's uh, as far as I know, there there's no real good answer for that uh, for doing a whole mass uh, spraying like we do for gypsy moth or something like that. So. Um, yeah, they have you know they've introduced uh, um, the, these uh, these little uh, wasps uh, that they tried. I haven't heard anything lately on those. Um, my concern with those was when they first announced those, 
is are they introducing some other non-native species that's going to cause problems? Maybe they're going to help us with the emerald ash borer, but now are they going to attack something else? So, and I really haven't heard anything in the last couple of years on those, uh, what's worked out, you know, if anything's worked with those. So, oh, yeah. You mentioned briefly that silver maples are not good street trees. Can you well, <laughs> sorry, that's that's a little biased. You know, I probably I probably shouldn't get into. So, so my you know people lots of times will ask me you know what's your favorite tree or what's the best tree, and I'll say I don't have one. It kind of depends on, you know, the location because there's there's even a you know I'll, I talk poorly about box elders a lot, but there is a good spot for box elders. Box elders do have a value. Um, we'll talk about them a little bit. Um, they do have a, um, a, a value um, as far as you know, carbon sequestering and, and you know, water uh, runoff um, mitigation, that sort of thing. Um, silver maples, and I used to have three of them in my backyard when I lived in Sun Prairie. Really liked them, they were really nice. They weren't too overgrown. Nice looking trees. Um, they shed a lot, which silver maples do. Um, but they're so silver maples and really most trees that grow really, really fast, they're nice because they get shade right away, but they're typically not as strong. They're not as strong rooted. Um, they, they grow a little, I call them a little more weedy uh, growth. Um, they still provide the shade. They still provide a lot of the, um, a lot of the benefits um, that we see with, um, we, you know, with everything that we talk about. They're, um, I, I guess just uh, from the standpoint of street trees, they're, they're just messier. They're, when there's a storm that comes through, it's usually silver maples are most of the trees that are down, most of the limbs that are down, partly because silver maples are overplanted, partly because they're just uh, branch unions aren't, aren't as strong. There's a lot of, uh, uh, just a lot of poor growth, unless they're, in, unless they're maintained early and often. So they're very high maintenance trees. I guess you can look at it that way. And, and that's uh, one of the big problems that, that we have. We just don't have enough staff time to do it. Um, if you have, you know, if you only have a couple in your yard, they're good trees. They do put out a lot of shade. Um, they do grow again really fast. Um, they are resistant to a lot of things. Uh, so they're not bad trees. I, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, they're just not my favorite to be in, in a street, in most street uh, situations. So parks, they're a lot better um, when there's a lot more space, when I don't have to worry about limbs falling down and, and uh, leaf collection, things like that. So, all right, I, uh, I'm going to move on quick. Um, um, so anyway, uh, so some of our goals really quickly, continuing to work on that species diversity, continuing to update uh, the approved species planting list. Uh, we do have at the city um, approved um, tree species that we, uh, that we do allow. Um, we do that so things like um, spruce trees aren't put on the, um, on the tree bank where drivers might have a problem uh, seeing, um, you know, and the, the police might have uh, uh, issues with uh, not having that vision tri triangle, that sort of thing. Um, and we also have, uh, for example, uh, maple, we put a moratorium on uh, planting maples. Uh, my first few years here we put that on just because maples, when we did our inventory, we found it, I think 28% of our trees here, might have even been 34 now to think about it. Yeah, it was 24 ash, it was 33 or 34 was maple. So one out of every three of our trees were a maple tree here. That, and, was that mostly silver maple? Uh, actually, the, the most that we had was Norway. Um, silver, I believe, was number two. So, yeah, so mostly Norway, and still most of our maple trees here are Norway. Um, but the concern, you know, just like ash, um, you know, um, the emerald ash borer is green ash, white ash, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, so if something did find its way and, you know, took care of uh, maples, that's one out of every three trees in the city is gone, well, public trees uh, would be gone, and that, and that kind of concerned us. So. Made a uh, few people not very happy because people like the color of maple. I like the color of you know, maple in the fall. Um, it's a good tree. Um, some people didn't like it, and eventually we kind of laid off a little bit, and, and, um, and in some neighborhoods we started putting it back in ourselves as well. So, um, so we do allow maples to go back in, just not quite as heavy um, as far as planting goes. Um, develop, uh, oh, continue ed, public ed. Yes. One yep. Go back to number one. Yep. Um, I grew up in Madison, and in the neighborhood I grew up in, there were a lot of oak trees. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about oak and Baraboo? Are there many oak trees? Because I don't see that many. The, uh, the uh, so Ashner Park is um, 
is you know our best example of oak. There's you know lots of oak there, okay. and actually, um, from what I understand, they used to there actually used to be students that would collect the um, yeah collect acorns down at uh, Dundashner, and um, just it was a ton of them there, and and I've had a few people you know over the years. Um, asking me to make sure that we continue to keep planting oaks, so because uh -huh. that's been that way forever, and you know people want to see uh, see that kept that way forever. So we've thrown in quite a few um, younger oaks there as well, because it does take oak a little bit longer to grow. It's a stronger tree. Along the uh, tree bank, there wasn't um, a lot here. I guess when we did our inventory, we've started to put in more and more oak trees, um, just because um, that was one species that was. Um, you know, readily available, I guess. Um, lately, it's been tougher for, for um, nurseries to get us uh, a lot, the diversity that we need or that we're looking for. Um, but oak has always been um, pretty prevalent through the nurseries that we work with. So we've been putting more and more oak um, out there. Um, again, it's, you know, um, a lot of it just depends on, on location, what's the best tree in a location. Um, oaks do fit into quite a few locations. Um, we do have a few challenges, you know, in, in cities, planting in, in cities with, you know, mainly with salt, with, um, with heat off the, you know, off the pavement, that sort of thing. Um, so there are a lot of trees that will do well out in the open or even out in the parks that won't do well on the street, uh, along the streets. That's why we really miss ash because ash was so good, um, uh, so good with road salts and everything else. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, Oak's been one of our... Um, one of our mainstays and, and one tree that we have been pushing more of. I think, uh, if I remember right, we were at uh, like 6% oak um, last I looked. So we were under that 10%, but we have, have room to add some more. So, uh, okay, I'll keep going here. Uh, so one thing that uh, we've been hoping to uh, start is a homeowner assistance program for, uh, for planting trees. Um, so, um, that's one thing that the gravel bed we're hoping helps with a little bit eventually. Um, there are communities out there that, uh, that do participate in um, seedling sales or, um, or working with the DNR on providing seedlings or smaller trees that, uh, that homeowners can, uh, can throw in their backyard or whatever. So, so we have the city, um, the city has a, basically we're, uh, we're in charge of the uh, the trees that are in the, the tree bank, which is basically between the curb and the sidewalk for the most part, and then the park trees. So, you know, what's in your backyard or what's in your front yard behind the sidewalk, we don't really get involved, uh, involved in. We're not, um, um, we're not supposed to get involved in those trees, and we're not supposed to get involved in those places, but there's a lot of places, uh, you know, in people's backyards where, hey, they'd love to put a tree, but, you know, trees can be uh, somewhat expensive. Um, so, so, that's one thing that we want to we want to get into doing is uh, offering trees to people, so they don't have to go to the nursery, they don't have to go to wherever to pick out a tree. They can just come to you know wherever and, and pick up a small seedling or something. They can get that education on how to plant that tree, how to care for that tree, and uh, and hopefully get uh, trees going in their yards as well. The urban work, uh, urban wood network is um, one thing that we started looking into shortly before we found EAB here. We knew we were going to have a lot of trees that were, you know, we had 1,400 ash trees. Most of them were going to be coming down in the next few years. I don't like throwing trees in an incinerator or a chipper. Uh, chipper, you can get some value out of them, but I don't like just throwing, you know, throwing a tree away. Um, there's a lot of communities that have been able to take their ash and turn them into really nice furniture. Ash is a great furniture tree. There are a lot, one idea that I really liked that some communities were doing, mostly larger communities, um, taking that wood and uh, turning it into lumber and using it for their park shelters when they build park shelters. Uh, even another community, I think might have been Madison, that, um, that would uh, give all their ash trees to their Habitat for Humanity. And the Habitat for Humanity had, uh, I believe they had their own or they contracted their own um, uh, mill so that they could make their own lumber. So then when they built their houses, they got it out of their ash trees out of the city streets from Madison. So those uh, ash trees were being reused. Those are one, things we, one thing we were really interested in. We looked into a lot more, way too costly for us um, and a lot of other smaller communities. We talked a little bit about uh, kind of partnering with some of the other smaller communities around us to kind of consolidate and hopefully make, bring that cost down a little bit. Something we're still working on, but the Urban Wood Network has been growing, especially since EAB. More communities are reusing their trees, turning it into you know, furniture and 
And uh, reusing that, um, the idea of, of working with Habitat for Humanity, I think is a great one. Uh, it brings their cost down. And then it's also a, a good PR thing where, you know, where, where we can say, hey, we're, okay, we're taking down these trees. Unfortunately, we lost them because of EAB or for whatever reason or a storm, um, but we're putting them to better use or to another use. Um, so that's one thing that we want to continue working on and um, uh, continuing to use those resources. So why trees matter? Um, yes? Yes. Um, that only included curbside and park. It did not include any personal trees. Correct. Correct. So yeah, we've got we've got about six thousand trees in our inventory that the city manages, uh, plants, maintains, removes when we need to. Um, but there's another we estimate, you know, probably as much as three times that many that would be private trees that would be in people's yards behind the, the that we don't we're not responsible for. So. Um, and, and we don't have a good count for that. Um, so, um, but yeah, we're, we're, guess, we're estimating you know, probably a good three times that amount. So uh, a little more on urban wood utilization real quick. Um, so there's, again, like I mentioned, um, there's a lot of opportunities to reuse wood. Um, costs have made that difficult. Um, still a little bit prohibitive, but it has been improving somewhat. Uh, there are uh, urban wood utilization groups out there. Um, you can Google them. And, and you can see some of the work that they're doing. Uh, actually, there are some big ones in Wisconsin that, um, uh, that are really behind it. Um, Chippewa Falls and Eau Claire, that area is doing quite a bit of it. Madison's doing quite a bit of it. Uh, and there's estimates uh, that the US uh, alone could produce over 4 billion board feet annually uh, just with reusing wood. Um, and you know what that does, that uh, reduces the reliance on taking down healthy trees elsewhere you know, that, um, that might be better off or better suited for um, you know, continuing to address the whole climate change, that sort of thing. So removing fewer trees and just using the trees that, you know, are down because of a storm or, or for, for whatever reason, other reason. So what are some of the obvious benefits of trees? According to treesaregood.org, um, so obviously there's social benefits. Um, you know, those are the, some of the obvious ones. People like the way they look. You know, it makes their yard look nice. There are studies that uh, uh, trees in uh, backyards of hospitals or, um, uh, or uh, uh, hospices, um, the health of the, uh, the people living there is considerably better than, than ones that don't have trees planted there. So there's a, uh, studies done with uh, reducing stress and fatigue. Criminal activity is reported, um, uh, data is reported that it uh, is uh, less in places that are um, more heavily landscaped with trees. Communal benefits, obviously they provide privacy, reduce noise and glare. Uh, and serve as urban wildlife homes. And those, these are, those are things that are more difficult to quantify. Um, but then we get into environmental benefits. And these are a lot of things that you hear about, of course, more and more with the whole climate change, things that you hear about you know, providing the air filtration, temperature cooling in the summer, wind breaks in the winter, and, uh, and water storage, which is uh, a really big one. And then, of course, the economic benefits, which, um, which a lot of uh, um, a lot of people, really drives a lot of people. Increasing property values, uh, decreasing the need for energy power producing plants, and then uh, using as a re renewable resource. So when we put values on trees, so now we start talking about how much is a tree really worth? Because some people, um, you know, when you get into, especially when you get into talking budgets and, and um, economics is, is important, as much as we'd like to save, as much as we'd like to be, uh, as green as we can be, there's always price tags and there's always um, uh, those considerations. So, so obviously different trees have different values depending on where they're at. Um, there are sites that you can go to where you can get calculations on how much your trees are worth and how much different species trees are worth. And we'll kind of go into how they, how they do value these. So, so what I did is I kind of came up with, uh, just to kind of show you what, um, what uh, Midwest trees are valued at. Took some of the more popular trees in the Midwest and told you, or just to show you what they're uh, valued at individually. So the, uh, the highest valued tree uh, in the Midwest that was, uh, that was on the list was honey locust. So this is based on a 15, uh, 15 inch diameter breast height. Um, and how trees are, I assume most of you know how trees are measured, but uh, diameter breast height is basically the diameter of the tree trunk, uh, basically between about your, the, an average chest and, and head right around that, uh, that area. So at a uh, 15 inch uh, honey locust, uh, $223. 
which uh, another five to seven years to let it get to 20 inches, it's $351. And then you can see some of the more common uh, trees there, maple, oak, hickory, walnut, elm. Mike, can you back up on that? How, yeah. how long does it take to get to 15 inches? <laughs> How long to get to 15 inches? Yeah, the growth, how, how long does it take for that? It, yeah, it, that well, some of it will obviously will depend on site, the soil, and the, uh, the growing conditions. You know, is it a warm, moist year, or is it a cold, dry year? Uh, to get to 15 inches, um, you know, that's a little over 20 year, 20, 25 years. Well, depending on the tree depending on which tree it is. It's usually about, um, you know, for the average tree, it's usually five to seven years for it to get another five inches on when it gets to 15. Um, a, a, tree, a tree will start slower and then it'll, it'll go a little bit faster. And it depends if it's transplanted as well too, you know. Um, so when we're transplanting a, a bare root tree, and a lot of people like to put in larger trees when they plant, especially new, uh, new homeowners, when they, um, you know, and, and I, you know, I'm the same way I get it. Um, you don't want to wait 20, 30 years for a tree to get really nice and big. Uh, you move into a, a new lot and it doesn't have any trees there. It's tempting to pay the extra money and have a tree company spade a tree and, and bring in a big tree and plop it down there. So you've got it right away. So you don't have to wait, you know, 20, 30 years to be able to enjoy that. But um, uh, those trees aren't as successful. You know, they'll die off more often. They'll cost a lot more. And many times a bare root tree, a smaller tree will catch up uh, catch up to a, a larger tree, a larger B&B &B tree, uh, will catch up in growth. It, it just takes a few years, but it'll catch up and it'll, oftentimes will surpass that other tree in growth. It just takes a few more years. Is there not enough walnut around here to show up on that chart? Walnut? Walnut, yeah. Walnut's with the maple oak hickory uh, oh, elm. Oh, oh, oh. Um, and walnut's a tree that um, you know, we, don't, we don't have on our street planning list obvious, for obvious reasons. We don't put fruit, uh, fruit trees on there and you know, anything that would drop on people's heads. Uh, but we do have, uh, we have had a few out there that we've had to, re had to remove. Um, the nice thing about uh, when we do have to remove a walnut is there's always someone that wants to buy them. So, um, but they are a very good tree. Um, and then you can see ash willow and birch and then coming down obviously a species. I threw box elder in there um, because like I mentioned before, I'm not a huge fan, but even something like box elder, which a lot of people consider more of a weed, has a value, um, has a value to it. And again, that depends on right tree, right space. So in some spaces, box elder is a great tree. Uh, it's better than no tree. Uh, it's better than some other options. There are even, if you go to this, uh, go to the site, treebenefits.com, they even have values for buckthorn, um, uh, sumac, you know, all that. So, yeah. <laughs> so even those things have a value. So, uh, you know, even a weed, you know, even your you know, garlic mustard, which gives us a terrible headache, um, it does some things for the, for the environment. So does some bad things too, but all right. So, so anyway, uh, kind of throwing these numbers out there. And again, a lot of these are, you know, where the, some people will ask, you know, how do they come up with these numbers? And, you know, this is overinflated or you know, whatever. Some people might say they're underinflated. So it kind of depends on your viewpoint. But um, so the city of Baraboo has about 6,000 uh, public trees, about, about 20, right now we're down to about 20, 20%, uh, a little over 20%. So our average tree is a maple tree and it's about 14 inch diameter. Um, so, and then of course different trees have different values. So we're gonna assume that the city of Baraboo's average tree is a 14 inch maple. So using that and applying that to, um, to what they tell us that these trees are worth, uh, our average tree is worth about $163 here in Baraboo. Um, and then if that, you know, grows for another five to seven years to a 19 inch tree, um, then it's going to be $249. And then if we apply that and we say, we've got 6,000 trees, the average tree is $163. That comes out to $978,000. So almost a million dollars. And, um, obviously we can't go to West Baraboo and say, Hey, you want to buy 6,000 trees? Million dollars, we'll give them to you. And you know, it's not that kind of, uh, kind of value, but um, um, but anyway, that's uh, that's the value, and we'll get into how they get to those numbers and where the values are. So this is that value of that $163 tree. So property value is estimated at $65,000, or excuse me, $65, um, based on the curb appeal, the uh, the sales. A lot of that comes from data from the National Realtors Association, but um, but. Tr uh, um, homes that are in mature neighborhoods, close to parks with, uh, with trees, nature parks, um, homes that have mature trees in them, sell for oftentimes uh, uh, on average 20% more than um, trees, or excuse me, um, homes that are away from parks, away from 
uh, trees that don't have those mature trees, and they sell a lot quicker as well. Energy savings, there's about $45 in energy savings of that average tree. Stormwater interception, this is a big one, um, uh, in my opinion. We've seen a lot of flooding here in Baraboo. Baraboo River floods a lot. Uh, we've had several 50-year, uh, 50-100-year uh, flood events in the last few years. Um, I've been here for 12 years, and, and um, I've been through two very major floods uh, very recently, and I came after the 2008 flood, so I missed that one. But, um, but so obviously in the last three years, we've had three major, major floods, and, and uh, that's happened all up and down the Baraboo River, obviously. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Air quality, $14 in uh, sequestering um, and uh, air pollution improvements. So and then, of course, there's other benefits, which are not really quantifiable um, based, on, uh, based on money, but uh, just as important. So breaking it down a little bit, um, property value. So this is, again, I uh, had mentioned about real estate agents. Uh, they do report that uh, sales are quicker and um, uh, 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 more successful with, uh, uh, with um, in, in uh, established neighborhoods, mature neighborhoods with trees. One study by the uh, NRA was that uh, landscaping can boost property values by as much as 20%, and then homes ne next to nature parks are typically worth 8 to 20% more than comparable homes. Um, and then, uh, again, there has been data uh, that's been shown that uh, home values can drop by as much as 20% after, uh, after storm events, lo loss of trees. So energy savings. So um, you've heard a lot about this. You hear a lot about focus on energy, and Alliant puts out a lot of good information on this. But uh, so this is, again, our average 14-inch maple. Conserves 232 kilowatt hours of electricity for cooling and uh, reduces by 28 therms. And, you know, if you're like most people, you know, what does that mean? We'll talk a little bit more about applying that to something that we can understand a little bit better. Uh, deciduous trees, obviously, placed on the south and west side of a home. You've heard that before. Uh, helps with your cooling costs, helps with your heating costs. Nice thing about a deciduous tree. Um, a lot of us don't like the... Uh, loss of leaves in the fall and it looks kind of barren and everything but it does serve a purpose it helps sunlight come through it helps heat up the home so that's why putting those uh, those trees on the south and west side of the home uh, the, they cool your house uh, in the summertime because it's blocking out the sun but in the wintertime when you need the sun it's letting it through um, conversely with the evergreens with the conifers they'll serve as good wind breaks but they'll also block out your sun and that's going to cool down that side of your home as well. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good varieties, but but at the same time, um, uh, a lot of people want that privacy, and in the winter time, you can lose that privacy on the south and west side of your home if you're putting in the deciduous tree. But anyway, talking about uh, energy savings, uh, again, a lot of this will depend on what types of tree you put out there, where you put the, put them out as well, and then again, what size they are. Um, then again, of course, shading paved surfaces, and that's where it's big in the cities. Uh, that's where it's big with us, uh, shading those parking lots um, as much as we can, shading those streets as much as we can. Not only really looks a little bit better, I know the uh, streets guys don't like uh, when fall comes around and they've got all this tree, uh, leaf, leaf pickup to do. Um, I've heard many times from streets uh, pe uh, people, you know, we should be putting our money elsewhere. We shouldn't be planning on, the, on streets because anyway, um, but this is obviously there's a big savings in... Uh, um, in reducing some of that uh, uh, excess ozone that can be produced. Stormwater breakdown. So again, our, our average maple intercepts uh, 1,441 gallons of stormwater runoff annually. Um, so trees will store a ton of water, uh, not a ton literally, but a lot of water in their trunks, their limbs, their leaves, uh, and their root systems. Remember that uh, the tree above ground, the one that you see, is only about a third of the size of that actual tree. Most of it's below ground. All those roots, um, those are sucking up lots of tons of water from uh, from the ground, and you know we talked about the uh, uh, the fifteen hundred year floods that we've been seeing here so often. If we didn't have as many trees as we have around here in Sauk County, it'd be a, a lot worse than what it is because because um, these trees are you know intercepting thousands of gallons of stormwater, storing it, and um, and releasing it into the atmosphere um, at a much better rate. So uh, the other thing, of course, trees are intercept intercepting that runoff that, uh, uh, that's carrying, uh, especially, th again, through cities and, and parking lots, the, the oil, the gas, the salt from the streets, um, stopping that from going into our, our waterways, into our marshes, uh, affecting our aquatic wildlife, and also our drinking water. 1,500-year flood events, we talked about this. 
uh, increasing significantly around the world, and especially here in Sauk County, we've seen that. Uh, it seems like every year down in the southeast, they've got uh, you know flooding going on. A lot of it's from hurricanes, but um, but obviously that uh, it continues to get worse as climate change uh, continues to uh, continue to can, uh, go on. Uh, one thing that I did mention here, uh, my my opinion, water is the number one uh, the number one element because and you really you really see it. I mean, obviously a plant doesn't get watered, you can see it wilting right away. Um, you don't get enough water, you get dehydrated, you know, things happen. So we need that water. But on the other end, um, so many lives have been lost by uh, flooding across the world. So, um, so that's where, you know, you know, trees are helping us filter that water, get, giving us the, uh, the clean water we need, uh, but also intercepting that water um, and uh, eliminating some of the, those flood risks that we have. So the air quality breakdown, and, and this is one of the big things that uh, when we talk about you know, greenhouse gases and, and climate change and that sort of thing, a lot of the scientists will focus on this uh, information. So, you know, obviously, um, um, you know, a lot of people are, are affected by, by air qualities. Um, so what trees do, you know, they absorb ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide through their leaves, uh, intercepting the dust, ash, and smoke, um, making the air a lot cleaner. Releasing oxygen, photosynthesis, we all learned about that in third or fourth grade. That was, you know, the big science class, uh, science class things in addition to uh, frog dissec dissection. Uh, lowering air temperature and reducing energy use, um, which obviously reduces the, um, the power plant production. Carbon sequestering. So our average maple tree reduces carbon in the atmosphere by 818 pounds every year. So, and you can see that uh, what a car, what an average car does to kind of put it in a little bit of comparison. So what does my car do if I drive an average size car, size car and I do 12,000 miles is what the average person or what they figure the average person drives in a year. So about 11,000 pounds of carbon. So you can see, um, you can see about uh, 11, 12, 12 trees kind of negates that. Um, and then in terms of air travel, um, you can see uh, how much that adds to the air. Carbon footprint uh, reduction's been a hot topic. Uh, it's been a lot of things we've heard of over the, over the last few years. Um, there are other ways, obviously, to, uh, to reduce that effect, and that's um, one of the good things that came out of, uh, out of COVID was we saw a lot more teleconferences, a lot more virtual meetings. That meant there were a lot fewer cars out there, uh, fewer buses out there, fewer uh, plane rides out there. And you saw, I'm sure you saw stories about that where the air quality in Beijing or, or Los Angeles was so much better. Uh, it was clear, you could actually see uh, people, uh, there were fewer breathing problems, um, you know, fewer medical prescriptions for breathing problems. And, um, you know, so that was kind of a, a slap in the face to, uh, to say, hey, you know, some of this uh, science was actually right, right on, and we, we got to see that. So, um, so obviously that's, uh, you know, that's one way, some more carpooling, um, and then, of course, continuing to research more. And, and I think, um, you know, you've heard some from, uh, from Powered Up Baraboo, working on some of those things like, um, um, like battery charging stations around the city so that we, we can support some more of those you know, um, non-gas powered engines, those, those type of things. So, um, so and, and looking into researching more of those because there is research out there. Well, you know, to produce those vehicles, are we putting you know, bad things into the air by producing some of those batteries, some of those vehicles? So we need to look at those as well. So uh, putting the best, uh, the best options out there. EPA said in 2012 that 82% of greenhouse gases in the U.S. was made up of carbon dioxide. And uh, so they stated the importance of forests in sequestering uh, uh, carbon. So in 40 years, uh, one tree would absorb uh, one ton of, of carbon. So, so and then, of course, uh, some other factors, the uh, non-quantifiable uh, factors. Um, so you can see that over the next uh, treesmatter.org, it says over the next uh, 50 years, one million species could become endangered um, if, uh, if this continues, deforestation continues. Uh, two thirds of the Earth's land based uh, animals are uh, provided shelter and food in forests. Uh, so it's an important food chain for, for us and for all animals, obviously. Crime reduction there is research out there that's shown that there's less graffiti, pr uh, property, and violent crimes in, in areas where there's more uh, green space and tree plantings. And then uh, research that we've heard before that. Uh, there are fewer issues with children uh, with ADHD and, and other problems if they're able to get out there in nature, learn in nature, uh, which is where nature classrooms uh, become very important for some of our schools. Uh, social Help, United Kingdom did a study um, 
that reported uh, places with higher tree densities had uh, fewer uh, antidepressant medications uh, prescribed. So, uh, so we see a lot of data like that where there's uh, fewer medical problems, insurance costs come down, uh, trees um, seem to provide uh, uh, healthy lifestyles that way, social health. So now applying this to Baraboo, so it's nice to say, to see all these numbers and say, hey, you know, this is great, you know, around the world, um, you know, we, we saw all this stuff around the world, but again, we live here uh, in Baraboo, um, you know, our 12,000 people, our, um, you know, our 6,000 trees, what, what does this really mean to us? So, so why trees matter to Baraboo? Um, again, we've got the 6,000 trees, so our, and this is just kind of a review, our estimated value is $978,000 based on the tree benefits uh, calculation. Stormwater interception, our trees are intercepting 8.5 million gallons, uh, which again, to make it, you know, what is eight, you know, what is, how much is 8.5 million gallons? Um, so that's 17 and a half Olympic size swimming pools. Uh, the Baraboo pool here is a little bit bigger than Olympic size, so that would be 16 and a half Campbell Park swimming pools um, that our trees are soaking up in water. So, and I can tell you from our guys filling that and emptying that uh, at the beginning and the end of every year, it takes forever. There's a ton of, there's a lot of water in there. So taking away the trees we have and dumping 16 and a half of those pools out in your lawns uh, would do a lot, of, a lot of harm, I would think. So going on a little bit farther, putting on the electricity saved, uh, uh, almost 1.4 kilowatt hours. Um, so I, and I was kind of interested to, to say, okay, you know, kilowatt hours, how much do we use here just in the parks department? So I, I looked at uh, our parks to, and I pulled up um, our aligned account and saw how much how much uh, we used in, in electricity in our parks last year. And I thought, oh, I'll show them that. Uh, that'll be a good, a good comparison. And I looked at it and I said, well, it's not close enough. So I said, okay, I'll have to add the Civic Center because we use a little bit more electricity here and we're still not close enough. So then I went to the zoo and the pool and I added those all, totals all together. And, and it was still, um, the, the trees that we have still save three times the amount of electricity that we use here in the, the parks department on all of those facilities in one year. Uh, similar thing with the, uh, the therms that we, um, that we see, the reduction in therms, 168,000. Uh, and again, that's about three times the number that we use for our uh, facilities here in the Parks Department. And then uh, 4.9 um, million uh, pounds of carbon sequestered. And again, um, what's that equivalent to? It's about 446 average size cars uh, in one year put out about uh, 4.9 uh, million pounds of, of carbon. So our forest here, or our, and again, this is just our city trees, not our private trees, uh, not the forest that surround us in, in Sauk County, but just the city trees, the 6,000 or so that we're maintaining is, um, is, uh, is saving those, you know, for, is negating the effect of 446 cars traveling 12,000 miles a year, yeah. Can you just elaborate a little more on the second bullet point? Like, um, okay, I understand how trees, uh, that the shade would, prevent, would reduce your need for air conditioning. What are other ways that, that electricity is saved specifically with trees? Mainly, um, you know, mainly it's the, it's the cooling that really, really affects more than anything else, mm -hmm. uh, the electric. So then anyway, just kind of uh, threw this in. Um, remember that every tree that you plant or care for increases these positive effects, the numbers that we saw on the environment and our property values, social and emotional health, and image to our neighbors and visitors. Trees planted today increase value, much like stable uh, financial investments or retirement accounts. As you saw, trees that are 15 inches now, if they're allowed to grow to 20 inches, uh, increase in value, obviously, just like your, your retirement portfolio does. Um, so think of it that way. Put a monetary account on it. And uh, obviously, the, the larger a tree gets, um, as long as it's cared for, well cared for, it uh, um, returns more in value, just like your, uh, your bank account can. Um, and uh, it has a greater impact for generations. Um, obviously, a tree that you, that you plant today isn't for you, it's for your grandkids. Uh, that's what we always tell people. Um, plant a tree today, and you know, you're probably not going to see it to maturity. None of us probably will, but our kids will, our grandkids will. Um, and if someone didn't uh, plant a tree or care for trees when, uh, when we were kids, we wouldn't be enjoying them now like they are here. And uh, the things we hear about, um, um, you know, climate change. Uh, one thing about climate change, and this is, again, my own opinion, but uh, climate change has been around forever. It's been around before us. Uh, the earth is a, is a living thing. It needs to heal itself just like we do. We get a cut on our skin. Our skin heals itself. It changes. Uh, the earth 
changes itself. Um, the climate change that, we've, that we're seeing um, now or recently um, has no doubt uh, sped up. So it's still going to be there, but the, what, we have, what we have done has sped that up. We, we don't have the ability to stop climate change. Uh, again, the Earth's, the Earth's a living thing, just like you don't have the ability to stop your kids from growing. You know, I would have loved, my wife would have loved to stop my kids from growing when they were about five or six. Um, that didn't work there in college now, so um, just in, you know, and the same thing with the Earth. We can't stop the Earth from growing. The climate change is always going to be there, but climate change um, in the past, long, long time ago, before we started getting in and, and uh, using our hairspray and our, um, our airplane flights and, and all of those things, um, long time ago, the earth would change at a slower rate where we were able to adapt, animals were able to adapt, plants were able to adapt to this new climate, to this climate change. Um, climate change now is, is you know, going at a faster and faster rate. I think I just saw something on the news the other night where you know, it was uh, you know, two degrees in the, uh, the Earth's temperature had went up in the last, I don't remember what it was, 10 years or something, whatever study they had done. So, and we're, you know, we're, seeing, um, we're seeing the ice caps melt and, and all that, that effect that's having, and, and everything's just getting faster and faster. And that's why it's, it's important that we, we do these little things um, uh, to continue to um, to address climate change because we're not going to stop it and we don't want to stop it. It's the earth healing itself. It's going to continue. It needs to continue, but uh, not at the rate that it's going at now because there's no way that we can adapt. There's no way that animals out there, that plants out there can adapt at the rate that the uh, climate is changing right now. So, so that's where it's important um, um, uh, um, paying attention to these things, paying attention to our trees, realizing that our natural resources, our trees, are very important to helping us slow that. Looking at our own, you know, uh, our own behaviors, and that's where you know, powered up Baraboo and, and the library are putting on, and other organizations, other conservation organizations are putting on these uh, important presentations. And scientists are trying to get us to listen to say, hey, you know, we gotta we gotta start acting now. And even doing little things uh, it might seem like, okay, we're we're Baraboo, we're 12,000 people. You know, what what we do, how is that going to affect the millions or billions of people that are out there? But there, there are more people that live in small towns like this and rural areas than live in the big metropolises, that sort of thing. So, so if every small town starts doing little things like these, um, you know, it's really going to make a big impact. We see a lot of things, you know, we've seen a lot of, of our larger cities that, that are coming out with their, they're looking at uh, doing these um, uh, net zero carbon uh, things by 2030. I think Madison just announced that, or one of the cities here just announced that. Milwaukee's trying things. There are other... Uh, bigger cities that are really working on things. Um, we need to be doing those things too. Um, Bar City of Baraboo. Parks Department is uh, right now, we're looking, we tried it last year, couldn't get it through the budget, but this year we're, um, we got permission to demo one of our, uh, our mowers as an electric mower. Uh, we're, we're trying it out, so uh, riding mowers as electric mowers, obviously we need them to go for eight hours, so our our staff can do it, but we're we're demoing it to see if it's if the cost is worth it. Um, so we won't have to hopefully replace mowers as often as we do. We won't have as much wear and tear on the the engine. We won't have as much cost on gas and oil. Uh, fewer maintenance uh, maintenance costs, and uh, and hopefully we'll have the same uh, the same results. Being able to uh, continue to uh, uh, mow the lawns that we have, and eventually hopefully we can get our fleets switched over that way. And we can look at our other uh, equipment as well and, and reduce it our, our carbon uh, output. And, uh, and we're hoping and we're seeing things with um, uh, Powered Up working with, uh, with, with the schools and, and the announcement with the solar. We looked into solar for, uh, at the zoo. Um, those are things that we continue to, to look at. And as we can afford them, uh, we'd like to look into more solar things for the city as well. Where the city's looking into battery charging stations, I mentioned that in various spots to encourage people that do have uh, battery powered vehicles uh, to have a place where they can stop in and, and, and recharge their vehicles. So, so little things like that that uh, continue to add up and, uh, and hopefully get our, uh, um, our emissions down to, uh, to net zero or something where we can help uh, slow that uh, climate change as well. So a little bit uh, information where I got some of the data from. You know, you can go in and Google anything uh, nowadays, but these are some, uh, some good sites. The National Tree Benefit Calculator is, is where um, you can get those um, values if you're interested in your own, um, your own home to see what, uh, what your, 
your trees uh, might be uh, valued at or, or to see how they came about, uh, some of their numbers. Trees Are Good is, a, is another good uh, uh, website. The Arbor Day Foundation uh, has a lot of good information. Uh, we have a really good uh, DNR here that we partner with in a lot of things. The, uh, the Forestry Division, who's uh, supplied us with several grants, um, they have a, a, a very good staff and a very good website uh, that can help you out in a, in a lot of things. And then again, uh, continuing to attend uh, webinars or, or presentations like this from, from Powered Up Bearable, getting involved with Power, Powered Up Bearable, um, and just you know, seeing what's going on, get on their mailing list, um, you know, find out about other uh, conservation organizations, get involved with those, and, and see what you can do, you know, whether it's in your own uh, property or if there's uh, uh, anything that you can do um, uh, to help out. So any other questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have some maple trees that are, have grown up and they have this huge canopy and they're very thick. Do you have anything on how to um, cut the limbs out so that it doesn't destroy the grass, all the grass is dead underneath it? And the, um, it's just, you go over it with a mower and it's, this creates a dust storm. I don't want to take make the trees down, yeah. but is there any, uh, do you run across anything about how to cull the limbs and reduce the canopy so that it's not a oh, right. all or nothing at all kind of thing? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the more mature a tree gets, obviously, the, the more difficult it gets to, to maintain, obviously. The more costly it gets to maintain as well. Um, you should never take more than 25% of a plant, of any plant, away. 25%. Uh, so never take, more never take more than, yeah, and try to do less than that if you can. But if you take more than 25, you're really going to risk the health of that tree. Um, um, you know, I know you didn't uh, say oak, but obviously, you know, make sure to... Uh, avoid oak, oak wilt, and, uh, but any tree really, uh, if you can prune um, in the, um, you know, in the winter time or during the dormant season, it's a lot better for, for the plant. There's um, also some grasses that are more shade tolerant. There are grasses now that are more shade tolerant, but I mean, I've, I've got the same thing, you know, at my place I've got one area that um, is just really shaded, it's just really hard to, to get anything to grow uh, there as well. Hostas. Hostas, hostas and impatiens and yeah. some other flowers that'll... I do like hostas a lot. My dog really likes hostas a lot. <laughs> so I can't get hostas to stick around for long. But yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, um, I, so you have like a, a pretty a forested area or no. pretty heavy? It's a backyard or... It's a backyard kind of thing or front yard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Really, it's really I, more a neighbor's tree than my, my tree, but it's sure. Go ahead. over on my, my property. Okay. okay there, there is another way that, that you can do that. You, you can also help the health of your tree. Uh, wherever you get branches in your tree that are crisscrossing and they're rubbing against each other, one of those needs to be removed. And uh, when you do that, it also uh, opens up the, uh, the umbrella of your tree so that light can get through and those kinds of things. But at the same time, saving your tree from getting diseased and other things like that that come from, from the constant wind moving two okay. branches against each other. Is your soil sandy under that tree? Um, yeah. You might be suffering more from water problems than, uh, than shade. You can get the soil faster. Yeah, yeah, you can send your soil. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, UW has some really good um, they'll do some tests, you know, they'll test, um, they'll test soil for you, um, send in a sample and, you know, they're pretty reasonable. Um, otherwise, we've got a lot of really good arborists um, in the area, just um, call them up and they'll come and they'll usually do a free evaluation for you. They'll give you some, you know, some advice and, you know, obviously they, they'll hope for your business, but, um, but most arborists will, will come out and give you advice for free if, if it's going to be, especially if it's going to be business down the road. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. One of the communities I used to live in, uh, which is pretty large, about 45,000 people, um, they had a, a group within their park district that whenever there were accidents in the city where a truck or a car banged into a tree, mm -hmm. that they went out there and did a follow-up to make sure that if that tree was scunned or anything, that they could uh, apply appropriate uh, 
whatever they call that, medicine when we would call it if it happened to us. But, uh, and then it saved a lot of their trees because uh, if, a, if a car hits that tree at 25 or 30 miles an hour, you can knock out a big part of the trunk of the, uh, the bark of that tree and that uh, instant, instantly opens it up to disease. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's a volunteer, volunteer group, you said? That no, it, it's something to do with their park department, I thought, uh, was, okay. was it did. But okay. the, the police department would give them sure. uh, a report on, on a daily basis okay. if there were any of those kind of accidents, and they'd just have it. Okay. two or three people that would go out and check it out. Okay, yeah, we, um, I do recall a couple of trees that I remember that got, have gotten hit here. One's actually over at Attridge Park, and or uh, yeah, Etridge Park, and that was a person that swerved to miss a deer, or said that they swerved to miss a deer at least. Um, but um, and that tree is still standing. But yeah, that had uh, a big chunk uh, taken out of it. I remember uh, going and looking at that tree. There was another one out on uh, east side of town. I don't remember which street, close to Langer Park, uh, that didn't survive. That got hit hit by a car. And um, so we will usually get calls if it's, you know, if it's a tree that's still standing, and you know, could it be, you know, does it need to be one that's taken down? Is it one that's a threat to uh, to safety, um, but um, we've gotten a couple of those calls. But yeah, we've got a smaller staff. That it is nice that you know there are um, uh, departments out there uh, that have that you know that have that time, and, and it's nice to be able to save a tree if you can, uh, even if it you know gets hit and, and do that medicine. Just, there, just there like aren't that many, there aren't that many accidents in, in trees, so uh, it's not like they're out there every single day. Right. Uh, yeah. Taking care of the yeah. trees that were caught that uh, have. Uh, uh, accident damage yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a cool program. Yeah, yeah. I have a two-part question. Yep. Um, my, the first part is, is there a list anywhere that tells, like, what all the species of trees of the city plants are? Yes. So, if, yeah. My second, the second okay. part, I'll go ahead and ask that. Sure. Um, does the city have a policy as far as planting native versus non-native species? So I guess your uh, first part of your question, um, if you go to the city, uh, city's website, cityofbearaboo.com, uh, go to our forestry tab, Parks and Recreation, and then go to the forestry tab. We do have a uh, page in there that does have all of our, um, a sheet of all of our approved uh, tree plantings. And it's also, it's broken down, so it has their shape and everything. So you can, if you're looking for a vase-shaped tree or if an oval vase-shaped tree, tree or a larger tree, a smaller tree, you know, underneath the power line. So we do have it broken down into those groups so you can kind of see, well, I need, you know, I've only got a small space or, you know, I don't, I've got a big canopy and I don't want to put another larger tree back there. Um, you can see those trees. Um, obviously those are, those are for, uh, for street and park trees. We don't regulate what people put in their backyards. Um, we don't have that authority. Um, so you can put whatever you want in your backyard basically. Um, but uh, we do, for our own planting, um, we do, um, um, we do stick to the natives um, uh, as much as we can. Um, we're, we're also, we follow um, DNR forestry as much as we can, and, and the DNR kind of uh, guides us as to, you know, what are, um, what, what are the regulated plants, um, not just the trees, but the shrubs and the, and the plants, um, and, and avoiding, obviously, some of the uh, some of the trees watching their list annually, they kind of send us their list annually. If new trees pop up that say, okay, this, whether it's native or non-native, you know, is now an invasive, considered invasive and don't plant it anymore or if you haven't, take them out. So we kind of follow the, you know, the DNRs, um, the DNRs list uh, really as far as uh, native, non-native and invasive species. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Um, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just very interested in what we're doing as far as community to promote yep. the support for pollinators and the whole ecosystem by yep. focusing on plants and trees that should be here. Yep, yep, yeah, and we've uh, we've installed I think five pollinator gardens in the in the last ten years. So, and what we're doing with that, not only for the you know environmental effect, uh, save the pollinators, save the bees, save the birds, that sort of thing, um, but we're also using it to reduce the amount of uh, land we're mowing. Um, I know when I came here, I just remember looking and, and seeing everything look like a golf course when I came here. And that's what I told my wife when I went home. I said, they've got a really nice golf course there, a lot of really nice golf course parks. <laughs> golf course parks. And that's from a staff that does a really good job and historically has done a really good job maintaining those parks. I mean, they look really nice. Um, but, um, you know, I, 
really didn't see a lot for, um, you know, we had the river walk and we had some forested areas around uh, by Lower Ostner and that, but, you know, no pollinators or, you know, really no natural areas or not much for natural areas. And it took me a while and after a while I thought, well, they've got Devil's Lake just down the road, you know, why do they need to spend the money on that? But that's where we went into, you know, we bought the Maxwell Potter Conservancy land. We wanted a conservancy there. Um, we now have the Jackson uh, Conservancy, another 60 acres on the east side of town that we're developing. But we put in large uh, pollinator gardens at the Arboretum. We put in the Arboretum as well. And um, uh, out at Pierce Park, out at Attridge Park now. Um, so we put in several uh, pollinator gardens uh, also to, because we were getting parks added, but they weren't adding staff for us to maintain those parks. And, and we also wanted to reduce our costs in uh, mowing gas and that sort of thing. So we, we took a lot of areas and we planted them in pollinators. It was a good PR thing. It also got the guys off the mowers a little bit quicker and, um, and took away those areas that didn't need to be mowed like a golf course and turned into, you know, some of those in. And, and we worked with, uh, with nurseries in putting um, native prairie plant, plants in there. And, you know, and I can you know, always give you those lists as well, but we have, um, we have different um, uh, seed mixes that we, that we work with um, and getting those in. But, um, but yeah, that's, no, that's a good question. Um, we're trying to do more with, uh, with the natives and, and um, trying to get away from some of the invasives. I know Todd had mentioned that we worked, we've worked together in a lot of things and I've utilized Todd a lot because invasives, in, you know, identifying and, and um, knowing how to get rid of those invasives isn't really my strong suit. That's not really where my background is. So that's where Todd and his group has really helped a lot with, uh, with the Bear Blue Range Preservation Association. And, and they've done a lot of really good projects like that. And that's what we've looked, you know, we've looked for kind of for that support. And that's kind of what we're looking to do with the new uh, conservancy out at uh, Jackson. Um, the city create some kind of partnership with, with homeowners where they could create mini pollinator or green gardens in the tree banks and yep. have, the, have the homeowner be actually the person that is the caretaker of that space even though it's city land. That's a good idea. Um, I will look into that. And actually, and Sauk County is doing a really good job too now. Um, I'll do a quick shout out to them uh, with Pollinator Garden. So they started a Pollinator Garden program and they actually partnered with uh, Prairie Nurseries, I believe it was, and, um, and several of us uh, communities and nonprofits around Sauk County got these free, um, basically 10 by 10 uh, smaller Pollinator Garden areas. Um, for free. Um, we got two of them. We've, there's actually one right outside uh, the front door if you walked in through there. We just planted that one. Um, and um, so, so, and they're really, and they're tracking these two. So they're kind of mapping them. So um, I believe it's up on their web, or they're working on getting it on their website. So people would be able to go there and, and see where these um, registered pollinated gardens are. And I believe right now that was for, I believe, nonprofits and, and governments, but I, I think they're working on getting that uh, for residents as well down the road. I think that's kind of the long-term goal. Um, but they've been working on setting up committees for pollinator gardens. So that's something that we're really interested in, and that's a really good idea, and I'd like to see the city do more on that too. So thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, I think, I know they promised they'd get you out of here by 8, so. Yeah, so thank you so much for all that you Thank you much. Okay. for us and thank you all for all that you are doing because you you didn't care about conservation and about trees and about the earth you wouldn't be here so just a word of encouragement what you do matters trees matter what you do matters so thank you and if you haven't already signed up to be on our list uh, for part of Baraboo if you're interested in helping us uh, connect continue to connect on these issues please sign up as you leave take a, a newsletter and Thank you.